So hopefully you can all see that. So it was such an honor to be invited. Thank you, Mariam. And I'll just be talking for about 15 minutes about my role before I hand over to Parry. So my name's Helen, I work at Sheffield Hallam University and my role is the advisor for students enrolled at the university from sanctuary seeking backgrounds. And I'll share with you what I do in my role. So I'll talk a little bit about my background and how my role came to begin. The work that I do with the students, the kind of support that I do and some of the casework and general support that I offer. I'll also explain a little bit about the work that I do with staff as well. And then just my own personal reflections on the role. So we might be joined today by people who are thinking of setting up a similar role, or maybe you're evaluating what the role looks like at your own university. So it might be helpful as well, just to hear about what's working well, and maybe some, some gaps in the role as well at Sheffield Hallam. So a little bit about me and my background. Um, really, my role is very much in advice work. I trained in a citizens advice bureau and then I went to work on in a student union advice centre. And then after that, I worked for a charity, Northern Refugee Centre, advising refugee and asylum seekers before I moved into my current role in the international experience team. So I work part time and this role started three years ago. And um, alongside my day-to-day -day role advising international students on visas and welfare issues, I'm also the advisor for students who are seeking sanctuary in the UK and, and are enrolled at Sheffield Hallam. And this role has really developed quite rapidly over the past three years, and we've recently got our University of Sanctuary status. And I don't have exactly a job description of this role. It's really quite fluid and quite flexible, which is, um, I think, led to a lot of benefits. But I'll share with you a little bit about where my role sits within the university to give you an idea of where I fit in amongst other student support services available for students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds. So at Sheffield Hallam, this is really what the support on offer looks like. And you this might look quite familiar to you at your universities. I'm sure that you'll have very similar support services. So just to give a very basic overview, we've got um, a triangle of support for every student where they have a named student support advisor who advises them on any academic issues. They then have an academic advisor um, giving particular academic progression advice and they have a named employability or careers advisor as well. We also have a well-being and medical centre, so offering counselling and all the medical services, disabled student support team. We have a very good advice centre within our students' union who can give a lot of legal advice similar to a Citizens Advice Bureau. Then there's the team I work in, which is the International Experience Team, where we support international students and any students going on international exchanges. Um, but quite unique to our university, we have a refugee rights hub where we have staff who um, assist with family reunion visa applications for refugees and also can take on some asylum cases as well, which I think is quite unique to our university. And we also have a law clinic as well um, that gives various um, legal advice to students and staff. So I sit, I'm within a team that sits within a broader support offer at the university. And in my role, the way that I connect with these students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds is through referrals from a team called Shoe Progress and they assist applicants. So all through the application stage to the university. And once those applicants have hopefully converted to students, they will pass me a list of the students they've supporting and I pick up the support from there. I also identify students through our sanctuary scholarship applications. So I'm heavily involved in everything to do with the scholarship application process. <clears throat> so I will keep a list of all the successful applicants and maintain contact um, after the scholarship applications. I send out welcome emails to all the students um, that I'm also aware of through, a, through our admissions records. So for all students enrolled from 
what I consider sanctuary seeking backgrounds, all the different immigration statuses connected to that, like humanitarian protection or limited leave. I ask for a big list of all those students with those statuses and send out an email to those students welcoming them and um, outlining the support on offer. And I also give them a, an information leaflet about what I advise on and the services at the university. And then I try and promote my role by um, contacting other student support services, letting them know that they can refer students to me directly. And then of course, I'm very careful about keeping any information that students share with me very confidential. And that's something that I really stress with students at all times that when they're talking with me, this information isn't shared with the home office and so on. I'm only going to very briefly discuss this because I'm aware there's been other sessions during a conference about sanctuary scholarship support, but just to let you know that I really am heavily involved in my role with all aspects of our sanctuary scholarships that we have at the university. We have three scholarships on offer. The scholarships pay for tuition fees and £4,000 maintenance grant per year. And I'm involved in, in every aspect, so from um, contributing to the terms and conditions, to advertising it, promoting it, um, shortlisting, and then supporting the transition of those um, scholarship students to being enrolled and then issues throughout their studies at the university and impact of the scholarship on benefits or asylum support. In terms of the casework that I do with students, I would say in my role, a lot of it tends to, tends to fall heavily into the category of financial support so advice around hardship funds we have an emergency <clears throat> hardship fund at the university which they can apply to and often we get um there'll be additional funds that come our way for example we're a, un a university um supported by santander and there were some additional funds that we've been allocated this year and we've been able to prioritize students from refugee backgrounds to receive some of that um underspend on some funds that we've got so in my role i'll be identifying students either who've applied for hardship or that i know of through discussions with students who would benefit from additional grants um that we can offer also it's it's really any queries that students bring my way so two years ago there was a very significant case i helped with um, for a student who had been funded in years one and two of his undergraduate degree by student funding england but in his final year they did they reassessed him and decided that actually wasn't eligible for support and that the decision they made in years one and two to fund him were wrong and that he should never have been entitled to any funding. It was really a very difficult case because there wasn't really anybody within the university who had the expertise of dealing with student funding England. And I'm not a funding expert myself either. But the reason why I supported him was because he was from a refugee background and there was a dispute by student funding England over his immigration status and his eligibility for funding. It took six months six months of me persistently contacting every lawyer that I could in London um, and getting a lot of knockbacks, going to various law centres, explaining his case until eventually six months in um, a, a lawyer took on his case under legal aid and did an amazing job. But that in itself took a lot of work as well. And I, and I helped prepare some documents for, for their use as well. They threatened court action and the long and short of it was that his funding was reinstated. So it was, I, I, I think what I contributed there was really facilitating his access to an immigration lawyer that nobody else really within the university had the time or necessarily the knowledge to push through. And it took a lot of persistence <laughs> to get to that point. And really without that decision being overturned, that would have been a devastating outcome for him because there just wasn't a route for him to fund his studies. And moreover, they were saying also those decisions we made in year one and two, you owe us the money back. It was it was really quite a devastating decision, but with a very positive result at the end. But it was after quite sustained action um, that he got to that point. The other thing I can offer in my role is some contact with the Home Office, but I'll qualify that by saying, of course, I'm not a lawyer. I won't get involved with asylum applications, but there are some things I can do around the edges. For an example, a student contacted me who um, 
she's just started at university. She just got her status through and a BRP should have been sent to her, but there's been some BRP production problems and she just wasn't getting anywhere at the home office. And it was affecting her ability to move on and, and access accommodation and, and apply for benefits. And in my role within the international experience team, we have a, a named contact with the home office where we can raise inquiries, usually typically about student visas, but I could raise an inquiry about the whereabouts of her BRP and try and, and, try and um, provide a route there for her to get some extra information. Um, other examples of things that I do, um, heavily involved in the support that we gave to our Afghan students studying at Sheffield Hallam following the Taliban um, takeover in Afghanistan. So that involved connecting the students to our refugee rights hub, to our wellbeing team and support from academics as well with regards to completing their, stu their studies and hardship funds again from the university. And finally, as I've mentioned already, a lot of signposting. So signposting to lawyers, I heavily signpost to the resources at the City of Sanctuary. I also really strongly use our Students' Union Advice Centre. So I don't know what that looks like at your universities, but I do really rely on them to give very good support and information regarding the impact of scholarships or hardship funds on students' benefit claims or the, on their asylum support. And I have quite good um, uh, links with them and it's a really good resource for us to be able to go there. Finally, just a few more things I'll touch upon. So I also try to ooh, progress things a little bit in the role and try out new things. So uh, last academic year I offered an employment um, advice session for students where I linked up with our careers team and we did a bespoke career session where I thought about and I tried to seek an understanding of what the obstacles that students from refugee backgrounds might particularly face um, when they're going into their graduate jobs and looking for graduate jobs. And then I also spoke about scholarships on offer for further studies and I got really good feedback from the students and it was a very easy session to put together actually. So I'd really recommend that to the universities out there. It was very um, it really didn't take a lot of work or organising and I got very good feedback. So I'd highly recommend that to, to members um, joining us today. One thing that we did try, but honestly didn't work so well was a networking session. So I linked up with a couple of other universities to put the students in contact, scholarship students in contact with other scholarship students at local universities. I have to say it was staff led, mixed results really. The students were quite quiet. We did it on Zoom and I'm not sure I'd repeat that again. Um, and luckily, Star has said they'll take over organising some of those networking events. And I think that is better as a student led activity. So I'm trying things, some things work, some things don't. The other things that I do in my role, I try to reach out to staff um, in the university to do some training and also reach out to our local partners in the city. So people working in charities who might be referring students to apply for our scholarships. <clears throat> so some of the work that I've done in general, so beyond the casework I do with students, is under the umbrella of our University of Sanctuary steering group. So I'm a member of that and I contribute to any items we discuss for developing our agenda and as a University of Sanctuary. I've helped to create a home fees policy whereby we can offer um, students from refugee backgrounds home fees. And I can talk about that in the Q&A if anyone's interested. As I've touched upon, I offer some training for university staff, particularly um, the team that I mentioned, Shoe Progress, who help the applicants um, and student support advisors, career staff where I can. And every year I hold a training session for our local charities to talk about student funding entitlements for students from refugee backgrounds and our scholarship provision. And then I get involved with things like celebratory, celebrationary events, scholarship promotion events, general things where I can and I have the time. Very briefly, some reflections from me before I hand over to Parry. I do think this role is really important in, in really filling in some gaps between the services where these students would otherwise fall through the cracks. Um, so it's really vital that there's this one point of contact, I feel, um, for both scholarship students, but for any student from, from refugee backgrounds at the university. But undoubtedly, there are some limitations I'm a white British woman. I'm not from a refugee background myself. 
So ideally, you know, I need to be learning all the time from our students or you would have someone employed perhaps from those backgrounds doing this role who has a, a, an innate understanding of the obstacles and barriers that students from refugee backgrounds would be facing. Um, identifying students who need support is tricky. So whilst I ask for data of students with all those various immigration statuses, the data isn't that reliable. Um, I don't always get a very good data set, to be honest, of those students. And then there's time pressures. I work part time. My main job is, as I said, advising international students on visas and welfare. This role as the point of contact for students from refugee backgrounds sits alongside that. So I often find that I'd love to do so much more, but I, I can't. <laughs> I just don't have the time. Um, but the benefits are, I would say, in my role, I've got a very supportive manager. I've had the freedom to really develop the role with, with her permission, be responsive to things that are happening and to shape policy like home fees and so on. So I'm going to hand over. I'm going to stop there. Um, so I realise I've taught for quite a long time, but I'd love to now hand over to Parry, who's a scholarship student at Sheffield Hallam, for some of her reflections on the support she's received. Over to you, Parry. Hi everyone, my name is Parry and I'm a Sanctuary Scholar. I study postgraduate course at Sheffield Hallam. Um, yes, yeah, so as Helen mentioned, I think for me, um, a person from a um, refugee background, it was very important to you know, get to university and without receiving the support from H Helen, possibly it was impossible. Um, so um, Helen, she supported me when I started my application and she contacted me during my uh, interview and about the resort and then about facilitate the payment. Um, and my, you know, enrollment at university. So that was very helpful because, you know, it was just difficult for a person who's um, my, you know, English was my second language. So it was difficult to be honest, to do all of these on my own. Um, and then I received a lot of support from university, like um, access to English classes. Um, and I guess Helen's role was very important in signposting all of the you know, available support for people like me uh, and how to get this support and you know, where to go. So that was very important, like getting English classes, employment support, and there are a lot of events for international people that Helen, she often sent me the Zoom or, you know, the time and I was able to just connect and share my experience and, you know, get to know other people and find some friends. And um, so I think that was very important. And um, so uh, during my studying, I received a lot of uh, like regular contact from Helen and she was just checking how is my university course and is there any more support? she can do for me and it was just helpful to know for example about um you know receiving mental health support from university and um, getting in touch with disability uh, department at university uh, for receiving extra support for you know someone who is in a refugee status and experienced trauma and a lot of you know uh, problems and um, so I guess that was very helpful for me and um, so far everything was very positive and I'm very grateful for all the support and um, I think the only thing I could recommend maybe is about accessing to counseling support for um, um, scholars who are from sanctuary background and uh, you know because they experience trauma and this, I guess, it might affect them during their studying or their exam period. Um, and I know that we have um, mental health support at uh, Sheffield Hallam, but I know that it's on demand and there are a lot of people who need this support. Um, so I just think maybe this is something positive that university, they can focus on it, that a person from sanctuary background who experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of, you know, um, escape from a war or prosecution, it might affect them during their university and especially during their exam exam period and this is something that I just thought um, it might be very helpful for you know people who are thinking about this role to bring together but I know that you know there are a lot of problems and limitation in resources but that's something from uh, my feedback um, yeah so I'm happy to answer to any question and thank you for listening to me
Thank you so much, Parry. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and um, highlighting the importance of mental health and well-being support and the counseling services, especially for um, CDC and Sanctuary. Um, I have, uh, and, and also thank you so much, Helen, for your fantastic presentation. Um, Parry, I know you uh, do need to go. So wh whenever you need to, uh, please do feel free um, to leave. But um, uh, there are a few um, really great questions in the chat. Um, mainly for Helen, but if you have anything to um, uh, say or add, Parry as well, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, so if you um, could take the first question, Helen, which is from Michaela, and she says um, she's definitely interested in hearing more about the home fees policy or how the case was made for it or how you convinced the university to agree. Um, and if you feel you need more time, Helen, uh, we could also take that question at the end um, if, if you'd like. Yeah, shall we take all, I can stay on till the end. So should we do all the Q&A at the end? And if there's any for Parry, we could do those now. That yeah, help. that sounds good. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions specifically for Parry, um, but Sophie says, thank you for sharing your experience. And she's asking uh, any other universities if they have any specialist mental health support services that they can share any information about. Um, so if you do have anything um, specialist or if you have experience with uh, providing that support to um, student seeking sanctuary at your university, please do share it with us. That would be um, really useful in the chat. Thank you so much, um, Perry, uh, again. And um, we will take those questions at the end um, since most of them are uh, for Helen. Um, so now I would be really pleased to pass over to um, Isabel at Birkbeck to speak to us more about her role and to also hear from Walid. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, and well done, um, yeah, Helen and Parry. It was a fantastic presentation. It's going to be hard to follow, actually. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to um, the Universities of Sanctuary um, for inviting me along today. I'm really, yeah, happy to sort of share my experiences in my role. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm used to using Teams, not Zoom, so just bear with me, sorry. <laughs> no problem, yeah. Where is it? Maybe it's because it's not open. There we go. Perfect. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, amazing. Um, so yeah, thank thank you, um, um, everyone. Um, and um, following on from um, Helen and Parry, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about my role at Birkbeck, um, which is not too dissimilar. And actually, lots of the things that Helen has mentioned is exactly what I do um, in in my role um, as um, an access officer, um, specifically focus, focusing on a program. I think that is the main sort of um, difference is perhaps around where my role sits within the sort of university college structures um, and also the fact that it does sort of focus on um, a particular program so that those are sort of the parameters I suppose um, which we're kind of striving for. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, specifically my role, how we um, support um, some of our sanctuary students um, at Birkbeck and then I'll hand over to one of our current students Walid um, who is um, in his final term um, with us um, at Birkbeck um, and he'll be able to sort of share some of his experiences with you about the type of support that um, he's been receiving this, this year um, and hopefully there'll be some time um, for some questions as well. Um, so just to start to give you a kind of a bit of an overview, um, in 2016, um, an academic um, basically encouraged Birkbeck to start to work, um, you know, with um, forced migrant communities around London and beyond, and was really, really keen to sort of set up a program um, that um, encouraged, um, you know, these people basically into, into university, into accessing different opportunities within um, higher education. Um, so then the college decided to sort of bring it to the Access and Engagement Department, which is Birkbeck's widening participation um, team um, within the college. Um, and together they created a programme which is um, we, which we now refer to as the Compass Project. Um, and the main aim of that programme is to offer advice, um, scholarships and also general support um, for um, forced migrant students who are entering um, yeah, Birkbeck as, as a university. 
So the Compass project itself, um, it has a number of objectives, um, which probably, you know, you can maybe guess a few of them, but these um, have also maybe changed over the years. So when we first sort of established it and the first programme uh, was uh, launched, the first cohort of students that we were supporting was back in 2017. I definitely feel like some of these objectives have maybe evolved over the years. Um, but generally speaking, it's very much to open up access to higher education for individuals of forced migrant background. That's the sort of overarching goal of the program. Um, it's also in line with a little bit about what we do as a university ourselves. Um, so because we are an evening evening um, university provider and we do have a lot of experience uh, with working with more mature students and people who have perhaps been out of education for a very long time, um, the program is therefore also aimed um, at promoting lifelong um, learning opportunities um, for mature students and people with minimal educational opportunities or who have not been able to access those opportunities previously. It's also to support some of the internal systems as well, so sort of to try to encourage improvements, make suggestions about how Birkbeck can actually make this process of applying to university and coming to university, um, you know, as, as you know, I guess as, as safe and as accessible as possible, making sure it's transparent as well um, for those individuals so they feel, um, you know, empowered um, through the process um, and that they have a really good start to their educational journey. Um, and the last objective here is also um, talking around the scholarship program. So to make sure that we are providing a scholarship program that really works for these students um, to make sure that it's, it's inclusive, supportive and definitely prioritises their needs. Um, so obviously a lot of research went into um, how we might want to facilitate uh, such a program um, to make sure that, you know, it doesn't just mirror a kind of typical scholarship program, but it does take into mind sort of maybe some of the specialist um, needs, priorities of, of these individuals. Um, so a lot of research did go, um, go into play when we sort of were first establishing it. Um, our partners were essential, um, sort of the local um, charitable partners um, around London who we've now built up a very good relationships with. They were very, very important and continue to be um, in sort of guiding what our offer is, um, guiding how we kind of facilitate things. And then of course our students sort of gathering feedback from them. So we do sort of adapt the programme each year, although the offer in its core, I suppose, stay the same. Um, we do try to make sure that what we're offering is very much you know, responding to the needs um, of the students um, as much as possible. Um, so I am pleased to say that you know, since we sort of started the programme, we've supported, I think around 94, 95 students on this particular scholarship program um, to access a university um, level de a degree program, um, which is amazing um, and it's such an achievement of everybody. So obviously this role that I um, hold in sort of managing the program is very, very um, important, but it also relies very heavily on the rest of the college and the rest of the systems um, that are in place um, because I could not do it alone basically. So it does involve a kind of a lot of working uh, with our international team and the specialists there, student advice, a lot of what Helen also mentioned, um, but they do at Sheffield Hallam. So I think that is very much mirrored that, you know, you can have this sort of standalone um, role, which is very, very important for so many reasons, but it's also the sort of connections with lots of the different areas of the college, which make it um, such a successful programme. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of student journey and kind of um, more focus, I suppose, today on the type of support and how we kind of guide, you know, these individuals who are seeking out these opportunities through the process. Um, because we all know that um, actually, you know, accessing higher education, no matter who you are, um, can be quite a daunting process, um, particularly if you're unfamiliar maybe with the UK systems or perhaps, um, you know, you're first in your family to do so. There could be lots of reasons why, um, you know, any, any individual individual might be daunted by this process. So a lot of it is around just making sure that it's ac is as accessible as possible, but also maybe introducing individuals to the prospects of actually coming back to university. Um, I speak to a lot of people through the outreach that I do, who, you know, perhaps are older, more mature students who have so many different experiences, different life experiences. And they say to me, oh, I don't, I never thought actually that I could go to university. And I think it's about, you know, really sort of 
encouraging people to the prospects of actually, you know, you could one day end up coming to study, not maybe with us, but with, with a university. Um, and I think that working, um, you know, with, with a sort of refugee forced migrant community, that's even more important because I think that um, sort of letting people know that there are scholarship opportunities out, out there, there are, um, you know, institutions that hold this um, university as a sanctuary status. Um, so universities, universities actively sort of encouraging applications, um, you know, from, from forced migrants in, in the UK, I think it can really sort of help to, um, I guess, yeah, sort of demystify some of the processes and actually reassure people that this is the place for them as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of um, that comes in the sort of first, um, first point of contact. Um, so that will either be through um, the sort of partner workshops and um, that I arranged with some of our local charitable partners um, in the London facility, uh, vicinity, sorry, um, and also at um, Birkbeck itself. So we host a number of uh, sort of taster programs, different open um, access events, uh, where we try to sort of encourage people to think about the university structure, think about some of the courses, um, and try to get people to think about whether this, you know, is something that they perhaps want to take on. So the outreach is sort of the first point of contact, and there are a number of sort of ways that people um, can then sort of engage with us beyond that as well. Um, when a student has decided, yes, I would like to come to university, there's then the sort of application process. Um, and also the scholarship application process as well, which um, we host a number of sort of drop-ins um, to sort of tailor our advice for students. Um, and um, we sort of make sure that there's um, information online, videos for people to watch. Um, this was particularly important, obviously, last year when we were unable to sort of do face-to-face -face events and um, sort of having those online um, videos. Um, I don't think we could have really done it without that, to be honest, because it's quite hard to sort of really take everybody through the steps that you need in order to make an application. Um, so um, once obviously people have then applied, uh, we've got the applications through um, and we've sort of decided and selected um, who is going to be coming onto the scholarship program. My role then really concentrates on, um, I guess, speaking to departments, speaking to the admissions team, uh, working through the student offers to make sure that the students that we've selected onto the programmes can meet the offer um, of the university as well. So a lot of that actually revolves around maybe advocating for the students, saying, OK, well, I know that you've asked for this, but actually, you know, they've got this instead. So it's sort of really trying to encourage um, uh, the process and I know that admissions are sort of done very differently at each university um, but I have found that you know without that um, actually you can really um, affect the sort of first um, point of contact with the university through the admissions through accessing um, you know that first few weeks of term which is really really vital so it's a process I'm still trying to work on uh, with the university um, but just to give a couple of examples which you might be familiar with as well is often around sort of English language requirements and proof of um, perhaps previous um, educational certificates so these are two areas that I work very closely with the departments and admissions on to try to make sure that these don't become um, you know, a reason not to come to the university, um, basically. Then through to um, sort of um, orientation and making sure that people feel well acquainted um, with the different services that are available to them whilst they're a student. Um, so that's introducing them to the library staff, well-being team, um, uh, learning and development team as well and also their academic mentors um, so that's really important I think sort of the first point of contact to make sure that you know they sort of can, can sort of see who will be supporting them that this um, that year um, and, and that they're more familiar with with the different processes um, the student journey then continues on to the first term and also probably second term where, you know, this um, for any person coming to university, the first and second terms are definitely the most challenging in terms of, you know, um, trying to make sure that you know what you're doing, basically, and um, trying to seek help for certain areas that you might be having issues for as well. Um, that then leads on to kind of making sure and supporting the students through, you know, transition towards the end of their first year and perhaps the end of the scholarship program as well, and um, to making sure that they have the best experience as possible. And then that leads on to also working with our alumni. So not just gathering feedback from them, but to making sure that they still feel included within um, the sort of student body. 
Um, so we do kind of um, send out regular newsletters for people. We try to showcase successes of our alumni as well. Um, and where possible, we also um, make sure that we um, kind of have some events for them to sort of fall back on as well um, and to make sure that they can still uh, stay in touch with um, Bert Beck and, and the rest of the students. So that's sort of the end of the um, student journey, but I wanted to concentrate now on a particular um, support mechanism that we put in place. And it's great to hear that, um, yeah, at Sheffield Hallam as well, they have a similar thing. Um, but I wanted to sort of focus in on our academic mentoring, um, which essentially was set up because some of the programmes that our students are going on to, um, such as the sort of higher education certificates, traditionally don't come with um, a, a personal tutor system, like lots of the other degree programs. So that's where it sort of emerged from. But then when we started trialing it um, with a first, and first year um, cohort of students, we realized that actually having a mentor, a named mentor that, you know, perhaps doesn't even sit within your um, you know, department can be really, really beneficial um, to make sure that there is somebody to kind of go to if you need any advice, any signposting, and also to make sure that the um, mentor has been really proactive in seeking out, um, you know, opportunities to speak to their mentee, which I don't think you get with the personal tutor system. I think that's very much, you know, um, it again might be different in different universities, but I think a lot of the time a student probably approaches their personal tutor, whereas what we try to do with the mentoring system is make sure that the mentors are getting in touch with their mentees, their students, to make sure, um, you know, um, they have the opportunity to speak to them about anything um, that, that, that might be um, of issue at that time. Um, so the mentoring system, it is all, they are involved in um, uh, all volunteers. So we sort of put a, put a call out in, in, uh, during the summer to sort of ask, you know, we've got this person um, who would like to be their mentor. Um, it involves um, annual training where we really sort of let the mentors know about some of the things that they might want to be aware of, um, trying to um, show them where they can go to if they need any more advice in supporting the students. Um, and this year we did se did set up a Moodle um, site as well, which has a collection of different resources and also a chat function for the mentors to sort of speak to one another as well, which I think that's been really, really successful so far this term. Um, we also make sure to introduce the students to their mentors at the start of term um, to make sure that they know who they are. And you can see the photo here is um, some of our mentors meeting students um, this October, which was really lovely. Um, and I guess the main role of the mentoring system is to make sure that they advocate for their students within the university structures. So wh wherever that falls really, often it's around, um, I suppose, um, mitigating circumstances, um, speaking to the departments if they have an issue at the time, um, maybe responding to anything going on with their personal life if they're, if they're having any issues at that, that time. Um, they might not feel comfortable sort of speaking to the department directly about that. So sort of having the mentor um, advocating for them can be really, really good um, in certain circumstances, um, but then similarly making sure that the student feels empowered to, to do so themselves. And a lot of it is around um, guidance, signposting, as I mentioned already. Um, but then the last point here is around actually making sure that the students have somebody to go to, um, you know, that they can speak to basically, somebody that will listen to them, take the time to sort of really um, hear about, you know, some of the things that they might be going through, not necessarily even offering advice, just being there to sort of listen to them. So offering empathy, offering support, um, and quite often um, they might also turn into friendships. Um, and I know that there are lots of students who have moved on from Birkbeck that do actually kind of keep in touch with their mentor, which I think is so lovely. And it shows that that mentor-mentee relationship is really working. Cool. Um, I know that we're sort of running out of time here, so I'll just very, very briefly mentoring, uh, uh, mention as well uh, one of the things that we do to make sure um, our students feel included in the student body is fostering the sense of community. Um, so we have things like a WhatsApp group. We do lots of socials as well throughout the year. Um, we have lots of opportunities to engage in workshops. Um, for example, we're doing one um, in the new year around careers. Um, Last year, Student Action for Refugees also set up a branch um, at Birkbeck, which is great. So I've been sort of um, supporting them to, um, you know, try to facilitate some 
workshops and um, social events, things like that, to maybe engage some of the wider community um, uh, at Birkbeck, so not just the students that fall under the scholarship programme. Um, and the last point on here is um, really around um, kind of identity and the reason why we want to foster this um, student community is very much the support, um, you know, being part, um, being a student, um, you already have an identity and um, they can sort of also look at themselves in terms of their fellow students on the compass program that's also another identity but it's also making sure and reinstilling the fact that they are a Birkbeck student um, and we want them to feel included um, in every sort of level um, as much as possible um, so the idea of fostering community is really based around that idea is you know your student identity is your primary identity and then you know if you want to sort of engage with these other things it's completely up to you as well so um, my role, which is obviously a little bit um, similar to Helen, um, but it's different in the fact that it very much falls within um, the sort of access. Um, so that's through sort of offering advice and guidance into um, and supporting students in um, making applications and ending up coming to university. Um, so when this sort of role was established, I suppose there was a natural reason for why it kind of ended up there. My role was very different to my um, fellow colleagues though in the rest of um, the access engagement department um, I, in that it really supports people um, and individuals through their entire journey with us. It's not just that access. Um, and I think that that's, Obviously, it's fantastic in the sense that it really supports students. They have a named contact. You know, we really get to know our students as well, um, which is fantastic. And we can really kind of learn from them um, as a result. Um, some of the other benefits um, for my role kind of sitting within the access and engagement department is around maybe having opportunities to influence as well and um, to sort of make recommendations to the college um, around certain things that they might want to do. I guess I've sort of become a the go to um, for lots of questions around uh, you know areas um, of support for our other refugee students uh, within the wider community so it's a really good place to sort of influence um, and it also really embeds forced migrants as a sort of widening participation um, demographic within the whole department as well so there's some of the benefits um, some of the challenges I suppose um, um, yeah uh, on the other side of things is um, that it did take a while to really establish this role and I think I'm still learning um, and I'm still adapting the role as well um, as much as possible. It also really relies on strong relationship building and that's really really key so a lot of the time it is around um, making sure that those relationships inside the college and also externally with partners um, are, are definitely um, yeah, uh, there and as strong as possible. And I think maybe some of the other challenges are around um, making sure that we um, include and we don't forget about the other students who are not inside the um, main Compass scholarship programme um, and to make sure that they also benefit from all of these things. So it's still something that we're trying to embed, we're trying to learn from. Um, and now that we are a University of Sanctuary, we're hoping that that will sort of um, enable other departments to really get involved and maybe pick up um, some of those students at other areas in the college, um, um, yeah, who, who we might not necessarily know about when they come into university. Brilliant. So that comes to the end of mine. Um, sorry for rushing the end there, but we are running out of time. So now I've got the lovely um, yeah, position of introducing um, Walid to everybody. Walid's a fantastic student. Um, he joined us last year at a very, very difficult point um, in, um, yeah, uh, in the fact that we were sort of in the midst of lockdown, things like that. But he's done superbly well. So I'm now going to hand over to Walid to speak about his experiences. Um, Walid, would you like me to keep the slide on or shall I, shall I stop sharing my screen? No, it's okay. Uh, I, I have just, uh, I will speak from my mind. That's, that's brilliant. Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry if my voice is not clear or because I have some problems in my voice. I don't know what's happening with me. Um, first of all, I would like to express my sympathy and condolences to the relatives of the victims of the drawings on the English Channel yesterday. So as always, I said, migrants fleeing from death to death. Honestly, I need maybe hours uh, to talk about the campus project uh, support I got as a student from a post uh, migrant background, not only five minutes, but I'll be make it, I will, I'll try to make it as short as 
as I can. So uh, I'm a refugee from Yemen, uh, studying postgraduate uh, certificate in management in Perpec University. My journey starts with Perpec with its open day event, with the supportive efforts provided to me from day one until today. The advice is given to me in terms of selecting the most suitable course for me was very, very helpful further to how to complete the application and enrollment at Perfect. And this is because of Isabel herself. The support I received from those of campus projects team, especially Isabel Habib and other Perfect staff and had a great impact on my higher education study with confidence. The Compass project, as you know, launched on 2016, a program designed for and targeted towards people from post migrant backgrounds who would like to continue their education at universities. And I was one of them. I have been supported with mental health sessions during my course. And this was because of my frustrated emotional and mental circumstances during my period of uh, the period of waiting for my substantive interview last two years. I was waiting for two years for my interview with the home office. And this impact a lot of pressure to me, uh, especially during study. Uh, so uh, the support I got from the uh, campus projects, also in terms of mitigate my exams, which conflict that time with my asylum interview last February 2021. Further to that, I got counseling services session from Perfect Wellbeing Team as a referral from the campus themselves, which was very, very helpful for me, particularly in the first term last year. Having a mentor of campus and campus coordinator had a great impact as well in overcoming many psychological and educational difficulties and obstacles. They were very and really helpful in terms of discussing my studies, answering a lot of queries and questions, arranging with my department lots of issues relevant to my exams and understanding the system in general. So it was very fruitful uh, friendship relation between me and the mentor, not only like any normal monitoring. Moreover, uh, during the last year we established, uh, Isabel Habib, she established the WhatsApp group and this WhatsApp group uh, enabling us and me as well to build a very good relation with other students as a platform to discuss many different topics and events. One of these events I remember, including meeting the other students for the first time, for the first time in the campus itself in the university, even though our classes were online because of the COVID last year. Finally, uh, we established the, uh, when the, stop, the Star Society in the, uh, was, set, was set up in the last year, uh, I knew that I want to get involved in the STAR committee, uh, committee to give back to my community at Perbeck and for my fellow students. Being a part of Perbeck STAR committee made me more affiliated with my university environment and enhance the sense of belonging and the responsibility to contribute positively to raise awarenesses among the students about the asylum and refugees in general, which motivated me and my colleagues and the Perfect Star team to launch some events, especially in the Refugee Week in cooperation with the Star National and Camps. In the end, I just want to say, I don't have all the words to say thank you for Isabel, thank you for Perfect, thank you for Compass Project. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Walid, for sharing your experience. And we're so um, happy and pleased that you've had uh, such a positive experience. And I know uh, from your wonderful work outside the university that that has empowered you to um, campaign and be an activist for all refugees and asylum seekers, but also uh, for equal access to education as part of STAR and many other organizations. Um, thank you so much, Isabel, for your fantastic presentation and the, the uh, positive impact that you are making on um, Walid and many other students throughout uh, your role and expanding it. Um, I am mindful of time and I, I know we have um, kind of run out of time, so um, apologies about that. Um, if you do need to um, leave this session now, uh, we will or I can follow up with you 